there's nothing like seeing a movie in the theaters. The popcorn, the soda, <laughs> the previews, all 45 minutes of them, and the crying children and the teenagers on their phones, and oh, right, going to the theaters is not perfect. But you know what makes it better? Going to the drive-in movies. It's all the fun of the big screen, but you're also in your own private world, free to turn up or turn down the movie's volume, block out whatever distractions surround you, and frankly, come and go when you please. Honestly, the only downside is when people don't know how to turn off their headlights. I love drive-in movies. So, in today's episode of When the Pictures Got Bigger, I want to honor them in my typical way, by making a video essay about their crazy beginnings, their awkward middle, and their surprising, uncertain future. Chapter 1. The Birth Did you know that the entire reason drive-ins came to be is because children were too noisy for regular theaters? The year was 1933. Alcohol was finally legal. FDR was in the White House, and a banana split was a whopping 15 cents. And in the small town of Pinsaken, New Jersey, Richard Hollingshead opened the world's first drive-in. That first theater was called the Camden Drive-In. It had nine rows of parking for 400 cars and was advertised as a place where the whole family is welcome, regardless of how noisy the children are. The first showing at the drive-in was on June 6, 1933. Back then, it would have cost you 25 cents to get your car in, plus an additional quarter for anybody in the car besides the driver. That still comes out to 5 bucks a person today, or one cheap family outing. If you went to that opening night, you would have been treated to a classic film. Any guesses? Keep in mind, this 1933 film is the first movie ever shown at a drive-in. It had to be huge. If you guessed the English comedy, Wives Beware, you'd be right. You know, Wives Beware, also known as Two White Arms. The one where a guy fakes amnesia so he has an excuse to cheat on his wife? Seriously, that was the first movie shown at a drive-in. In spite of the questionable opening night showing, Camden was massively successful, and it wasn't long before every major city was building drive-ins of their own. The 30s were successful, but the 40s were gargantuan. There were many reasons to go to a drive-in in in a post-war world. It was a cheap date night for GIs and their beloveds. It was a good place to go with your baby booming family. And it was a cornerstone of Americana, of U.S. culture, in a time when nearly everyone was a patriot. So, the 40s surpassed the 30s in drive-in revenue. And by 1947, there were 150 theaters across the country. As the decade passed and the baby boomer generation began to grow up, they also started to grow nostalgic for the theaters they were raised in. Which brings us to the biggest boom of the birth of the drive-in movies. The late 1950s and early 1960s were the peak of the drive-in. In In 1958, there were over 4,000 drive-in theaters. So, in just over a decade, they multiplied by a factor of 30. Everyone was obsessed with drive-ins. And then, the gimmicks came. Since they were such a family-friendly outing, soon theaters began offering baby bottle warmers and diaper vending machines. There were mini golf courses and swimming pools and pajama nights, and at the Star Theater in 1955, Colorado, there was even a hotel built to face the screen. Everyone adored drive-ins, parents who didn't have to pay babysitters, teens who could do whatever they pleased. and young kids who enjoyed the social aspects without caring what was on screen. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a drive-in, mini-golf, swimming pool, diaper vending machine palooza? But, like all good things, the golden age couldn't last forever. Which brings us to chapter 2, the death. The death of the drive-in came in many manners. First off, you have to consider the limitations of the theaters. They can only show movies at night, and for half the year, that meant one less hour of showtimes. In some states, you couldn't show any movies in the winter, for there was too much snow to come park or drive. And if it rains any night, well, now that drive-in has a lot of refunds to issue. 
Those problems alone shut down many theaters, but the major nail in the drive-in's coffin was the oil crisis of the 1970s. Oil got to be expensive, and people stopped wanting to drive to a drive-in and spent all that money on gas. Other people downsized their cars, and that made going to a drive-in uncomfortable, too. And that's when things got really weird. In order to make up for that lost revenue, some theaters got the idea to, um, well, <laughs> to show things that other theaters wouldn't show. That's right, drive-ins in the 70s became a hub for watching adult movies. I guess in your car, alongside a dozen others. <clears throat> Hello, I like money. What inspired you to- Money! Uh, the reputation of the drive-in movie plummeted when that happened, and so now, if business wasn't bad enough already, drive-ins also had a negative reputation to overcome too. This meant that most studios would only send their B-movies to drive-ins, and save the big hits for the premiere screens. Other factors are worth mentioning too. Home video was improving with every passing year. There was color television, then cable TV, then VCRs and video rental stores. And when the boom of the malls came in the 80s, it simply made much more sense for a landowner to turn their massive lot of land into a shopping mall instead of a drive-in. So with the same suddenness of their initial boom, drive-ins fell off the map completely. By the 1990s, there was less than 200 still in operation. What was once a cornerstone of American culture was now a dusty corner of the country's aging closet. Chapter 3. The Rebirth But wait, drive-ins weren't dead just yet. If there's one thing you can count on, it's retro trends making novel returns. In the late 90s and early 2000s, drive-in theaters began making an unexpected comeback. You could call it catering to boomer nostalgia, or maybe it's just that that era of film was full of blockbusters best enjoyed outdoors and rowdy. There were regular drive-ins, of course, but there were also guerrilla and boutique theaters popping up too. Guerrilla drive-ins were impulsive showings when people began using LCD projectors and speaker setups to create drive-ins in their very own yards and public spaces. Typically, these guerrilla drive-ins organized themselves with sites like Facebook or MySpace. Did anybody here have a MySpace? How did it work? That was before my time. And uh, Guerrilla Drive-Ins mostly showed indie films or alternative programming, usually nearby actual theaters to offer counter-programming. Your kid could go watch Spider-Man at the Camden, while you could enjoy Persona at the park. Boutique theaters, on the other hand, were all about that classic experience. These theaters had food trucks and jungle gyms, and I'm guessing at least a few had diaper vending machines too, but I couldn't find any sources on that one. So. What are the future of drive-ins? Honestly, it's pretty uncertain. According to driveinmovie.com, only 321 drive-ins were still around, and only 30 of those were in operation back in 2019. That was a far cry from the peak of 4,000 in the 1950s. But when COVID-19 hit, those 30 drive-ins suddenly had a massive surge in attendance. Jim Kopp, who runs the family drive-in theater in Virginia, said, we're surprised. There are a lot of folks anxious to go out and be safe and get some movie entertainment. But we're surprised was underselling it. In 2019, drive-ins accounted for just 2% of box office revenue. But in 2020, they generated 85% of the box office. And on some weekends, the North American box office was 95% drive-in movie money. All this according to CNN Business. So, more drive-ins opened, and many of the closed ones reopened. 30 turned into 40, 50, 60, and in May 2023, a reported 177 drive-ins were in operation. The rebirth of drive-ins has been a sight to behold. They've multiplied six times the number, and with the rise of nostalgia, could we see that number continue to grow? That's why the future of drive-ins are so uncertain. With an industry that basically exploded due to COVID restrictions, can it sustain itself in a world without many of those restrictions now? I went to a drive-in theater with my girlfriend last month. It's what inspired this video. And compared to the attendance of the times we went during the pandemic, it was night and day. There was almost nobody there, and the entire place was shoddily falling apart. It was sad to see, especially when compared to the drive-in experiences of 2020 and 2021. But I still have hope. I have hope for the renewed interest in drive-in movies. As long as there are people who know what they are, there's going to be people clamoring for their existence. 
I don't think we'll ever see drive-in movies die completely, just like vinyl and DVDs are still being sold and appreciated today. And if you agree and appreciate drive-ins too, then why not find the nearest one to you and spend a memorable night there soon? We have the power to keep drive-ins thriving, simply by going out and enjoying a movie under the stars. Just don't forget to turn off your headlights.